I'm Paul Bayes with GreatDad.com, and I'm here another one of my series on talking to dads who've done a lot of a lot of thinking about fatherhood. And I'm excited to have Jeff Nelligan with me today. Jeff is a published author, has been on the bestseller list on Amazon for his books on parenting, specifically. Uh, a couple of them we'll get into a little bit deeper, but four lessons for my three sons, how you can raise resilient kids in his most recent book, Your Kids Rebound from Pandemic Lockdowns, which obviously is very, very timely and a lot in the news. So welcome, Jeff. Hey, thanks for having me, Paul. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to have our conversation because you and I talked a little bit beforehand about uh, about how, well, especially your book, how, uh, The Lessons from Your your Four Sons, and the idea of kind of ha having uh, a plan for when, you know, when you have kids and what's, uh, how you want your kids to to show up. And a lot of, I think a lot of dads, a lot of people obviously have kind of a vague idea, you know, I want my kids to grow up uh, with these, yeah. you know, these sort of values or, you know, we're a religious family. We have some specific tenets that we all kind of agree to in our mm -hmm. community. But, um, outside of that, I, I, I'm really a firm believer of kind of like the Steve Covey's kind of idea of start with the end in mind. And I, I, I have that feeling that you're kind of in that same camp as well. I am. And that's a, it's a, it's a great allusion to it. Um, because that's how I started when my sons were very, very young. And indeed, and you're smarter than I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they were very young. I mean, five and six. And uh, which is when kids really start to grasp the real world around them and understand distinctly what's right, what's bad, what's good, what's bad, what's inspirational. So yeah. I like the Covey approach. I knew what I wanted out of them when they were five years old. And today, now, let's say two decades later, I pretty much believe that the path they were on resulted in who they are today. Oh, that's... And I might add, all three are military officers, two naval officers, one army officer, um, and two went to academies, one went to Williams College in Massachusetts. And you yourself have a military background as well, right? Correct. I was in the Army Reserve for 14 years, enlisted, um, which is was enough. I'm, I'm not on a par with the guys who are active duty, like my sons. But yes, I do have that background. I'm just I'm just curious, did that kind of inform your thinking about this, that, that you that in the military, there's more of a, you know, a, I think more of a plan and more, you know, like a lot of co corporations nowadays have mission statements, but in the military, that's very yeah. common for people to know what their job is, what they're, you know, what where they're growing, where they're going. Yeah, that's part of it. I think when, when kids are young, and I think dads who are hearing this will appreciate this, the one structure that is really, I found invaluable, is the team sport. Hmm. And from the earliest age on, from four on, I pushed them into sports, and I said, we'll start with soccer, we'll get to lacrosse, you can swim, we'll play basketball, you can play football, ultimately. But having that cohesion of a team, the, co the cohesion of the parents around them all the time, the ferocity of competition, and also just the idea that you have benchmarks to getting better. That's a real structure and discipline that I think for them, where they found transferred best was into the service. Not every kid is built for the service. I, I, I completely understand that. However, the, the best traits, you know, that adversity, the camaraderie, the, the self-betterment all come from being on those those kind of teams yeah yeah I personally I don't I, I don't I don't know if every kid like like the service thing what like every kid is meant for team sports either but I totally right. get your point I mean I, I I I think that that is one of those proving grounds for for one of those things one of those uh, structures that parents can put their kids into that provides a lot of those kind of guide rails and a lot of those those values that we're talking about here Correct. And I, I think that the, um, the allegory is not just related to the athletic fields. It's anyone that's in a band, anyone that's in a choir on a theater stage. The best thing about it is those kids are being publicly judged, you know, and in a, in a game, at a, even in an individual sport, a swim meet, whatever, you've got half the crowd that's rooting against you. And if that doesn't make a strong kid, then nothing will. Yeah. So. Yeah. It can be anything 
outside of athletics, but that involves that group working towards a goal. Yeah, I think that's really key. So t- talk to me a little bit about the uh, – because I, I, I'm encouraging dads to look at three or four values and taking a, a look at a whole bunch of a whole bu- a choice of a whole bunch of values, look at their own life uh, critically and think of what the values are that they have that they want to impart on their kids. Tell us a little bit about the four values that you define for your kids and how that. Sure. Can- and, and as I said previously, you know, I like the word values. Values are enduring. It's not just yesterday or next week, I'm going to have a different value on um, I had four in the book. The, the most basic was just basic courtesy. Mm-hmm. You show up places not on time. You show up early. You follow through on projects. You know your role when in a group of people or just among just a few peers or friends or family members to always act in a, in a decent, self-respect, courteous way. That was the first yeah. The second was just the idea of building confidence in a kid. Uh, you know, uh, you, you had one of those great statements. You said, um, what are the keys to developing resilience? Boy, you know, it can't be put better than that. And I was going to answer putting your kid in a tight situation. But I don't, I'll, I'm going to amend that. I'm going to step back and I'll say, giving your kids constant tests of independence. Mm. Because everyone in this and you know this, Paul, I mean, for goodness sakes, you have kids too. No one gets a free ride. Everyone runs into obstacles and setbacks and trials. And the sooner, the younger they are, like you said about building young, the the younger they are in facing and hitting an obstacle and having to get around it or get over it, the better, because it just sets the stage for bigger obstacles down the road as they grow older. And it gets that almost muscle memory, that reflex, that whatever hits them, it's not going to be some drama. It's not going to be a panic. It's not going to be chaos. It's going to be looked at as, I can get around this. I just got to, I've just got to dig in and how am I going to do it? Okay. And that's a really an interesting one, especially, you know, I think we all kind of flail around trying to figure out what is, what is appropriate? When do you step in? When do you let them, you know, sink or swim? Um, I wonder, yes. do, you, do you ever think of that intentionally? Like, you know, it's about time for an obstacle. Let's, let's, what, you know, what can I do? Like, you know, you know, this is, you know, it doesn't have to be yeah. big, but you know, there's an age appropriate thing where the kid is seven or eight and you say the, the, the store is a block away. Can you go down to the store? Here's a dollar, you know, buy a yeah. apple and come back to me. I mean, what, that, I, that what I would like do appropriate kind of thing, a kind of challenge that you could give your child to, to show, to, to prove to them their own ability and independence. You know, your, your example is almost exactly what I used. Oh yeah. I would, at a certain age, when the eldest was seven and the youngest was four, I, we were in a mall and I took out three $5 bills and I gave one to each kid and I said, okay, go get change. This isn't a race. If you strike out one place, go into another, but bring me back change from this. And of course I kept an eye on him. The youngest is four, you know, he's a pretty (laughs) young kid, but they managed to do it and they came back and they were all excited. And I, so I just kept upping it. We'd go to a restaurant, a carry out, and I'd say, junior, you, or you take all the orders, memorize them. Here's the money. We'll see in 10 minutes at an airport. The eldest is nine. Here are our tickets. Go get our boarding passes. We'll be right here and don't come back without them. So they got used to these tests constantly, you know, thrust upon them in different kind of venues and just became very expert at reading the crowd. That is understanding how they fit in and who to go to if something was amiss. The, the best story about the resilience is my kid was five years old, the youngest at a mall at a birthday party with a bunch of other kids and two very disorganized parents. I'm sure every dad has been in this situation or most of them. And so the the parents wandered off with 13 of the kids and left my kid and two other five-year-olds behind in the food, food court. And they're just standing there. But the kid remembered what I told him once. I said, look, man, you guys are so small. If you get lost in a crowd, look for that guy or that female 
with the stripe running down their leg because that's either a policeman or a soldier and they'll help you. So he immediately thought that, got the other two kids looking and about three minutes later got a mall security guard. But those are those kind of tests of independence that you kind of build upon slowly and slowly. And you're right when you said you began this with age appropriate. Yeah, I didn't do this when they were, you know, three years old or anything like that. No, and I did, you know, I kept an eye on them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just four. But the idea is you give them these tests increasing in kind of volume and intensity and they get used to it. And that's that, that second value. The third value was just resilience and adversity. You know, you get an F on a test, you play badly in a game, you have an argument with friends that doesn't seem, you know, it doesn't seem really like it's gonna ever end. Or you're on the outside, a kid, you know, kids bullied. My youngest kid was bullied when he was in elementary school because he, brand new school, he wore glasses. He was really big for his age. Um, but, you know, confronting adversity, which relates to resilience. I told him the story one time I was out with them. I had just lost my job in politics. You know, that's what happens when you're in the south side of an election. And we were out at the high school field throwing the ball around like we did every weekend. And I said, finally, I said, look, guys, one more completed pass. And we'll get the donuts. And my eldest kid froze and he said, Dad, we can't afford donuts. Oh, you lost your job, you know. And I said, yeah it's the end of the world and I said come over here we're going to sit in my office so we sat down on the 50 yard line and I said I did lose my job and things don't look great right now but when we can't afford the donuts I'll tell you in the meantime I need you guys to keep me company and you know I need work at quarterback mm -hmm. and they kept using that phrase years later to just describe any scene that they were in because it gave them that kind of deflation of the drama balloon. It gave them that idea that I, if dad can joke about that losing his job, then, you know, this isn't too bad. Yeah. So that's the, the, the resilience part. The last one is just ambition, you know, never settle for anything less. And I made a point of saying, driving around big office buildings all over Washington, DC area. And finally, one day I said, you know, you don't want to, so see all these buildings up there in those buildings is a guy in a cubicle with a Redskins mug that you like you guys made me in second grade and a picture of the family on the desk. I mean, dads can relate. And he's sitting there staring at a screen like he's been doing for five years. And he's going, what the hell am I doing here? Because he was going to be somebody. Right. And I said, guys, that that guy, that's your dad. So you need to reach a lot further than I got. And, you know, it hit him. Um, and it really, we've never forgotten about it. But that's the thing. A, a kid respects the candid parent. Oh, yeah, I think that's very true. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you, you, you've spelled out, I guess, three slash four, courtesy, confidence, resilience, and ambition. I want to make sure it's clear to anybody listening that those are your the values you have, and they're all very very strong, great values, admirable values. Uh, other dads may choose to augment those with different things, replace certain ones, or put other ones in different yes. uh, priorities. I'm like I was pitching to you uh, gratitude as a, as a value. Oh. I was pitching that one. Amen, um, brother. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, but I, I want to get back to one thing we were talking about with the, with the intentional uh, free ranging of your kids, because things have changed so yeah. much since you and I were kids. You know, this used yeah. to just be part of, being a kid was the door open at four, you know, at, at before dinner or after dinner, and you ran out and played in the street for you know, a couple hours with your friends, and you came back and when mom yelled dinner time, and you had plenty of this kind of time to explore and get into trouble and get and get out of trouble and everything else. And kids don't get that today. So I think this is a really important message about uh, intentionality as a parent because you have to now give them some of those challenges that we we got just kind of out of our American childhoods. You're, you're right. And it's a great way to put it. We just took it in stride that after dinner, we would be gone for an hour or two, just roaming neighborhoods or doing something. You know, as you said, I love that getting in trouble and getting out of trouble. <laughs> um, so that's why I think you have to set it up in this modern age. You know, that story about getting the five or going to kind of a sketchy 7-Eleven to go get Doritos and beef jerky, you know, and sending them in there with the dough and saying, look, 
the world doesn't always is not going to look like Bethesda, Maryland, or Potomac, Maryland, or Annapolis. The real world is going to look a lot harder and grittier and shabbier, and you have to learn how to make it in those places too. Um, but I think you set it up. You know, after I I did an inter interview with NPR with the, the um, reporter there, Michaeline Duclef, who lives in San Francisco, you know, blocks away from you, Paul. <laughs> but I said, I said to her, you know, I gave her the story and she said, you know, I'm going to try it with my daughter. She sent her daughter who was seven years old down to the store from her apartment to get something and, and come back. And she says, I was just on pins and needles the entire time, but the kid pulled it off and did it. And so those, those examples, those tests are available anywhere, anywhere you want to be. Um, I really, I, it, you know, take some creativity from a parent, but that's what parents have to have. Yeah, well, I think that's all what, what we're largely talking about is being being uh, more intentional and being more present as a parent rather than just, uh, right. you know, seeing how it all turns out, which yeah, yeah. quite often works. I mean, in, in most cases, a lot of kids are going to, they're going to survive and they're going to thrive. That's, we are human beings and we will, we will figure it out on our own. But if you want your kids to be a certain way, it's, it, you're it, helping them is going to, is a far better route to making sure that that success is there. Yes, I yeah. agree. So how did in your so you have your four, four lessons for your three sons and then and then um, how you raise resilient kids kind of followed on after that did they dovetail or did they the are, are the lessons integrated or they is that a different book entirely? Well, rebound is a much different book. It's more of an empirical work. Um, I work at FDA and here in DC, and I've served on Capitol Hill for many years, and I served. Um, as with two presidential appointments, the last one being at uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, the pandemic hit and it seemed that all reasonable minds fled. And <laughs> early on, it was my thought that, kid, I, I thought this two months in to lockdowns, let's say about May 15th, uh, that I thought, oh my gosh, the kids who are sitting at home, the, the damage is gonna be severe and more severe every month it lasts. And of course, I don't like to be right, but it, that's what happened. The book cites, as I, it's more, more than 250 sites to medical and psychological literature, Hopkins, Gallup, uh, MD Anderson, UCSF Medical School, um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Pew, Kaiser. And two, th the three things that emerged is too much screen time. Screen time was always a factor previous to this. In fact, I wrote about it in my three sons. Don't take away the phone, which can be done. The second was the idea of lack of self-confidence, the mental health issues until the point where in January this year, it was discovered, not discovered, it was revealed that over half of kids between the ages of 10 and 18 had a major depressive episode because of the lockdowns. And the third thing is just the physical health went to, was shot. The obesity factor rides. Now, I mean, you've got now if you've got an eight, kids, there's something like 27% of kids between the ages of something five and 18 are obese or overweight. And the numbers just keep crawling up. And so it was the, the mental, the physical, as well as this addictive screen time, which cuts into both. It hurts the mental aspect and it also degrades the physical aspect. And that was rebound with the site. So it's not... I'll tell you, Paul, it wasn't a dad like me with a string of anecdotes about how bad these lockdowns were and masking and the, the whole 24-7 mass hysteria. It, it's cited throughout, as I said. Yeah, I, um, well, you can, to there are a lot of arguments about whether how many millions of lives that saved or not and everything, but I think it's you're totally spot on. It, it was not good for the kids. Now, if balancing everything else out. I, I don't know what the answer was there. But getting back to the, uh, focusing on the part of, about the screen time, because I think every parent worries about this. I, I'd really be interested in your opinion, because we we in our family, and I, we always talked about the, told the kids like, you know, it doesn't matter what other parents do. In our family, right. we do this. And well, yeah. two things. One is we did not give them cell phone. We did not give them cell phones until they were about 12. And we gave them we intentionally gave them flip phones that had very limited c capacity, and they did not get yeah. iPhones until they were 16. So I, I, you know, 
maybe my kids were <laughs> easier going than others, but I, I, I'm interested in your perspective on how much parents can say no, because I think modern parents don't think they can ever say no about phones, social media, screen time. I, t I don't want to make this a mutual admiration society. <laughs> but I, have to, <laughs> I have to say your example. I hope every dad, if they listen to one thing on this program, they listen to what you just said. Because two things you said, number one, we're not like other families. You know, dad and mom are in charge. Right. Number two, the fact that they're not getting those iPhones until 16. I mean, you have, they have escaped from such a volume and torrent of bad stuff. Yeah. Um, and indeed, and they thank, rebound, they, they're, most, they're 19 and 23 and they actually, they thank us now. Um, oh, and they kind of enjoyed being the, they kind of enjoyed being the, you know, the, the poor little kids who didn't have social media or a phone. Like, you think you got it tough. I don't even have an iPhone. <laughs> but uh, no, you go ahead. Th that's, an ex that's such an, a great example. Um, I, I, wow, I, I've really never heard that from a parent, and I talk to dozens of them every week. Uh, that's the way to go. And indeed, rebound in rebound, the chapter on screens is the first chapter, and it's the most powerful. For example, kids today spend eight between the ages of ten and eighteen spend eight hours and forty nine minutes a day average on some kind of screen device. I call it the glowing rectangle. Yeah, and that doesn't include school. Yeah. Oh wow. That's more time than they sleep uh and the idea that a parent is letting them getting away with it you know we all should be the pauls of the world but it's it's particularly devastating for young girls and yeah, yeah. the I'm literature on that is huge yeah, dr huge. jonathan Haidt, dr gene twenge who just has a, a new book out about screen time both of those have documented research that stretches back to 2003 um, on the, the effects of phones, and then in 2010, the effects of social media as it became more and more prominent. My advice, and it's in the book, is, you know, let, let the dads and moms be like, Paul, you sit down with us. We're not like other families, and moreover, we're going to give you a screen contract. And there's I, four examples. I mentioned that, contract. and I never never got around to it. But I, I think that is really good. A lot of that's what a lot of parents do when they say when they give them the phone or the potential to get on social media, they have certain rules around that specifically. Right. And it, and it is important, I think, to like again set you know setting up with the end in mind. If you don't want X behavior, you have to define that behavior and not right. blame it on the kid when the kid does something that exceeds because they don't know. They don't know. They don't have any boundaries. They don't have any rules about right. the way things should be. They, they're looking to you for for leadership. Yeah. And that's that's it. They don't have boundaries. And so and that's one of the themes both in Four Lessons and Rebound is ultimately with my my sons and I, it seems like with your kids, it came down to, I'm the parent, you're the kid, there's no negotiation. You know, that's the way things are set up, since, you know, from about 5,000 years ago. This is how it's going to work, because I know those things are destructive. I know they're damaging. Yeah. So we're going to sign this contract together in order that we can put those boundaries, as you say, in place that didn't exist. Yeah, I don't want to be, yeah, it's it's easy for us because we didn't grow up that way to, to kind of put a value on it, but, but obviously you studied this a lot and you know it's not, this is not an age generational thing where, oh, you don't understand. Yeah. It's, it's, it is really uh, harmful if overused. And I think, I think there is this, this change, this, uh, this time difference where if you let a child get into social media at, at 11 or 12, at the beginning yeah. of adolescence, you are creating a, a kind of a habit and a way of looking at the world that's all about FOMO and victimhood and uh, oh my uh, everybody's better than I am and or I'm better than everybody else is that is is it's it's being introduced it's introducing adult ideas or adult temptations and sins at a very early age it's as though you've read Dr. Haight and Dr. Twenge because <laughs> you're right no well, I, I have a few conversations from time to time so they, 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 well, the the culture of adulthood is suddenly pressed on an eleven year old, and of course the victimhood is, you know, so apparent. You know, it's inculcated society. But you're exactly right about that. They shouldn't see that because 
that's one of the reasons for the depressive episodes, you know, in the research that was done, particularly with Dr. Haight and with Twenge, is that, and they looked specifically at teenage girls and how it's just the, the cycle ever ending. You figure eight hours, 49 minutes a day, nine hours a day, or the uh, kids, young boys between the ages 13 and 18, average yeah. two hours and 46 minutes of video gaming every day. Right. Yeah. If you yeah. took all the kids in that age group, that's what your average would be. Um, I, I, that's just at, you know, that's appalling. So they're being introduced to ideas, as you say, that they shouldn't be around. And, you know, you say, well, it's a generational thing. No, it's documented that this yeah. stuff is destructive. Yeah. And it doesn't thing. help. I do, I just one last thing too, Paul. It doesn't help if mom or dad are sitting over in the corner scrolling. <laughs> yeah. stuff. You know, if you're going to, uh, and my kids rarely saw that. The, the most ashamed I've ever been is when my kids said, dad, when I had this pretty high powered political job working for his cabinet secretary, he said to me one day when we were playing basketball, you always look at your phone. Yeah. And I was humiliated. And I said, you know, here I am banging on you guys about screens. And here I am caught. And I said, you're never going to see it again. And they never did. Yeah. And it, it still makes me feel upset. Yeah, well, upset. yeah I, I, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I think you did a great job. If your kids are calling you on the, on the lessons that you were trying to teach them, I mean, more power yes. to you. That's, uh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. great signal. One, one other, con one last concept I want to ask you about, because I'm very, um, this is another thing that I kind of bang on. Uh, you know, I, I, I try not to lecture dads because every dad has to do it in their own way. And I am not, yeah. I don't have your, I don't have your family situation. I have your income level. I don't live where you do in most cases. I can't tell you how to live your life. But I think there are yeah. certain principles and certain platitudes about parenting that I think are important for dads to at least pay attention to, whether they decide, hey, that's that's full of crap and you're old fashioned. I'm that's I'm fine with that. Yeah. But one that I, I that I talk about a lot is the fact that as a parent, you are responsible. You are the guardian of your child's innocence. And you can decide to give let them wow. take away their innocence at any age. You know, you can expose them yeah. to things that are, that are, you know, are horrible at age five, or you can try to keep as much as you can to the extent you can in the modern world. And it's not easy. It's not there. Out there. But I think that's a really a role of, uh, of a parent. What, what do you think of that? I like that. Uh, you know, you had that, you had a question, you know, what's the, what's the key dad platitude? And um, well, before that, you'd said, you know, what is a dad? And I have to say, I'd never thought about that. And here I am pontificating about it all the time. And I, it's just a great question. And, you know, it kind of brought me back to the old, the old army days and, and exercises we had to do when I was in the infantry. And I thought about your question and it came up, you know, the dad is the guide who walks you through that minefield and your hand is on his shoulder and the brother's hand is on his shoulder mm. and there is complete trust and complete obedience because you know that, that guy who's leading you through your dad that minefield has nothing else but your safety forefront in his mind yeah. safety's like your innocence comment it's very close yeah that's what a dad is in terms of a platitude i mean i mine is always read the crowd because in the real world You've got to know how you fit in. And that crowd could be your best friends whom you know, have known for a dozen years. It can be a football stadium full of people. But here's a maybe a better one. And I always said it to my kids. Prepare your kid for the path, not the path for your kid. And the path in this real world is rocky and it's tough. It's difficult. And a kid that can get over that is, is going to grow up to be that resilient kid. Yeah. And again, I should also say, and I'll just end with this. When you talk to dads, I mean, I think it's great you do that because, and you're, you're wise enough to, and you just said it, you don't lecture, you know, and I think I fall sometimes too much on that. Oh, because don't. parents, can, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> At our gender age, we kind of have a right to say we learned it. We're always right. But when I talk to parents like that, they'll come to me. A lot of parents will say, you know, Johnny is, smarter than he's in school he's not trying johnny hangs around with sketchy friends uh he's not trying his best i'm worried about his 
you know, his overall personality, he's rude to people sometimes. And I will always say, well, if you're serious about this, it's going to take so much work. And that's the lecture part comes in because then I'll say, you know, here's, here's the book or here's my thoughts because I've been talking to parents for 25 years in every venue under the American sun. And I say, you know, here's how you can do it. And this is very simple. You know, it's 75 pages, you know, big type. I said, but don't come back to me in a year and tell me he's the same way because you wouldn't have listened and he's never going to change at a certain point. Kids won't change. Yeah. So that's hard. That's hard on the lecturing part, but it's also this, the seriousness of seeing your kid at age 25 is sitting there at the market saying, would you, you like your milk in a bag? It comes, it comes down to something that stark yeah. and the starker you make it for dads and moms, maybe the more that they realize and wake up. Oh yeah. 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 That, that, you know, the, uh, the, one of my other platitudes is the, the, you know, the days are long, the, the years, the years are short and the years that you actually yeah. have an effect on your children wow. for dads is yeah. between the ages of two and about 12. So I, you know, to the extent where you can make a maximum yes. impact, lead them during that time frame when they are all here. <laughs> You are the, like you say, the the leader, the platoon, the platoon leader, or whatever whatever metaphor you want yeah. to use. That's that is the key time, and uh, it's, it's right. short, well, but I, it's a lifetime. Well, Jeff, it's really a pleasure. Ages. Can I just say one last thing? Yeah, yeah. Those you're right about those ages, because after 13, that kid is pretty much molded into what he's going to be. So yeah. I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. Well, it's really been a pleasure talking to you, Jeff. Uh, I'm glad we share a lot of uh, a lot of the same a lot of the same philosophies. Uh, I don't always have I don't always have to have them confirmed, but it's always nice. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can find you can find uh, Jeff's books at uh, Nelligan Books NelliganBooks.com. Yeah, and yes, on sir. Amazon. So those three titles are Four Lessons for My Three Sons: How You Can Raise Resilient Kids, and then uh, is it Rebound Your Kids Rebound from Pandemic Lockdowns, or just how? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, your your kids rebound from pandemic lockdowns. Okay, been a pleasure. Uh, hey, thanks, Paul, again. Yeah, and you can find more about uh, my coaching at uh, greatdad.com slash coaching. And I'm actually working on developing a course for young dads, really focusing on a lot of the topics that we've uh, talked about today. And you'll probably end up seeing this podcast as one of the, the source materials because I think we've covered a, a lot of the a lot of the key concepts today. Thanks again, Jeff. We'll see you see you later. All right. Thanks, Paul. Bye.